stop the recording before we have questions. So if um, if anyone wants to ask anything or have a bit of a discussion, then um, the recording can be stopped for that. OK, so I'm going to speak today about um, research integrity and reproducibility and how they work together. Um, and I'm just going to get started. So I'm going to go on and say a lot about um, what can compromise research integrity, but fundamentally research integrity is about good research practice. Um, and as you can see from this first slide, um, the four pillars that are often cited when talking about research integrity are reliability, honesty, respect and accountability. So reliability in the quality of the research and in the design and methodology. Honesty um, in developing and undertaking and reviewing in a transparent and unbiased way. Um, and we'll come on to talk a little bit more about um, transparency. And respect, respect for researchers, including any research students that you may have working with you. Respect for um, any participant that takes part in your research, for society in general, and for the, env the environment and any part that that may play in your research. And accountability, um, accountability for the research through the process from concept to publication, accountability in managing and organising your research and for any training um, and mentoring that might happen as your research has a wider impact. So we're going to start with the negatives um, today and then move towards the positives. So um, click on to the next slide. So starting with the negatives, with bad or poor practice. Um, so it would be really nice to think, um, sorry, I think there's somebody starting, trying to join a different meeting. Francesca, would you be able to have a wee look? Yeah, yeah, I will check that. Thank yeah. you. Um, so it would be nice to think um, that nobody actually sets out to falsify or to deceive, but the dangers are there um, with research practice. Um, so these cases are hopefully rare, but when misconduct does happen, it can have a hugely negative effect on public, percep of pu on public perceptions of research and its reliability. Um, so the European Code of Conduct for Research Integrity breaks research misconduct down into three main areas, and that's fabrication, falsification and plagiarism. So fabric fabrication is interpreted as the blatant making up of results um, and recording them as if they were real. Falsification is manipulating research processes or changing or omitting data. And plagiarism um, is appropriation of other people's work without giving it its due credit. And I couldn't resist this little um, comic strip from Cal Calvin and Hobbes here. Um, and I think Calvin's involved in a little bit of falsification of his research there. Um, so examples of bad practice, there are a few quite well known ones, quite high profile examples um, that have breached these codes of conduct. And in these cases, um, really have damaged public trust and perceptions of research reliability. And the first is a really well known case of Andrew Wakefield, who claims a connection between autism and MMR vaccines. Um, he spoke out about the this against the single vaccine, which caused a huge furore in Europe and in America and influenced many parents in deciding um, whether or not to have to give their children vaccinations um, for MMR. Um, and ultimately leading um, to resurgence in cases of measles because people were choosing not to vaccinate. Now it transpired that he had flouted ethics protocols, subjecting children to needless procedures and that he'd made false claims. It also turned out that he was funded by a solicitor that was taking a legal action against the vaccine manufacturer and that he'd actually filed a patent um, for a new vaccine. So huge conflict of in interest, um, flouting of ethics protocols, some pretty major red flags there. And despite the red flags, it still took around 12 years for his papers to be retracted. And I think to this day, um, it stayed in the minds of parents of young children. 
So um, as we can see, the damage can be quite quick to inflict, but can take a long time um, to undo. And we're going to have a wee look at Retraction Watch um, and um, retracting papers and how difficult that process is. Um, another researcher who um, I've mentioned here published on the benefits um, of red wine. And I think people are more than happy to believe that drinking red wine might be good for them and more than happy to go along with that. Um, however, he was eventually found guilty of falsifying and fabricating data on 26 articles and on grant applications, mainly due to man manipulating the presentation of experiments. Um, there was a three-year investigation after the complaint um, was received by the Office of Research Integrity. Um, but despite the, um, it being in the press at the time and the length of the investigation, I don't think the papers in this case, case were actually ever formally retracted. Um, and again, those health benefits of drinking red wine are now firmly lodged in the um, imaginations of the public, whether or not they are actually there in reality. So um, what are these poor research practices? Um, so I've mentioned a few um, here. Um, we talked about flouting ethics protocols previously, conflict of interest, falsification of data. These are all pretty major um, and misleading practices. There are also, however, other poor method methodological research practices that might limit um, the reproducibility of research, um, which we're going to talk about um, in a little while. Um, and we're also going to talk about how open research practices can guard against um, these per methodological practices. So the first of these per research practices is harking, um, shortened of har um, hypothesizing after the results are known. Um, and it's where a hypothesis is generated to fit the results and then presented um, as if it had been formulated before the results were obtained. Pre-registration or registered reports, which we're going to talk about, um, can really help to guard against this or accusations of it. Um, we're going to talk, as I said, a bit more about pre-registration, um, when it can be useful and how to go about doing that. Um, P-hacking is where the results are manipulated until the researcher finds results that have the right kind of statistical significance for what they want to say not necessarily what the results them, themselves are showing. And outcome switching is where certain results um, are not reported or results are switched to highlight the favoured results that show what the researcher wants to say. Um, and as I said, we're just, I'm just going to mention and talk a little bit about retraction watch. Um, so if you haven't come across it before, it's a website slash blog slash movement um, and it was started by two US ac academics, Adam Marcus and Ivan Oransky in 2010 um, to report on the retractions of scientific papers. They had developed an interest um, after they had seen or they kind of noticed a, a rising level of retractions in papers. It's not clear why retractions have risen over the last five to ten years. It might just be generally that more papers are being published and it might also be that we now get have um, better tools um, for detecting things like plagiarism. Um, so they say in their blogs that about two thirds of retractions are for misconduct and about a third for things like mistakes and samples or statistics. Um, they talk about um, things like image manipulation happening, which is a really interesting, fascinating um, topic if you want to look into it a bit more. Um, data massaging and plagiarising um, as the most common causes that they find for the detraction of research papers. Um, they also explain um, that they started the blog because they felt that retractions just weren't being announced anywhere um, or the reasons for those retractions given or being made available to the public. And they worried that those decisions, like people suddenly drinking more red wine because they thought it was good for them, and they worried that those decisions might be being made by the public and um, based on invalid results um, that were out there in the public domain. 
And in, as, as I said here, so they started it in 2010, wondering if they would have enough material for this blog. Um, and they found themselves 13 years later with um, almost 47 and a half thousand entries. Um, so definitely not short of material. Um, around the time of coronavirus, they started to notice attractions in papers um, on that topic, and they've actually created a separate area on their on their blog just for coronavirus paper retractions. And there are hundreds of retracted papers on there as, in that section as well. So around about that time, um, obviously there was a sudden um, explosion in research papers in, in, on coronavirus in that really short space of time. And it was really, really important to the public um, around that time that these um, the information that they were getting and reading was reliable. OK, so that brings us on to um, this little excerpt, excerpt from The Guardian. Um, so as I said, around about 2020, in the time of coronavirus, there was a huge rise in people trying to access scientific um, information. And it was more important than ever um, that people felt that they could trust what they were reading and trust what they were accessing. So this survey um, shows that uh, a little um, survey done around that time in 2020 shows that 97% of people answered that it was important that the data was openly available for them to check. And actually around about that time, data became one of those kind of buzz, buzzwords that was um, been just mentioned a lot. Um, so we'll come back to open data as a tool for achieving um, research integrity. Um, but I really think the pandemic and public attitudes towards science at that time were a real catalyst in the movement towards people starting to see the value and importance in open research practices. Um, so what sort of things can influence research integrity and what are the pools towards good practice um, and what can pull researchers into sloppy or poor practices? And there's just a slide here, and as you can see on the green side, there are the really positive things moving towards the red side where there's those kind of more negative pulls. Um, and actually, the whole sort of research industry itself, um, can publishing model itself, can in some ways put a lot of pressure on academics, um, the, the pressure to publish at all costs. Um, people often talk about the publish or perish model um, and sometimes academics can feel as if their career genuinely won't progress um, without not just publishing but publishing in the right journals and high those high impact journals. Use of metrics like the H index and other journal impact factors um, and the promotional structures of universities can also cause real pressures. Research is feeling that they constantly have to prove themselves um, to try and climb that academic career ladder. Um, these pressures can cause um, a little bit more quantity over quality, that then that can become a problem. Um, we've seen the rise in what some people are calling paper mills. Um, in the worst cases, um, there are brokers selling written to order papers aimed at publication in a particular tier of journal. And again, paper mills are a huge and interesting topic if anyone wants to look further into it. Um, and although these papers can be hard to spot, one of the red flags for these papers um, is that authors might refuse to share their underlying data. And again, this is another pointer um, towards the importance of good open research practices, um, open data and data sharing practices. Um, so again, these barriers and um, what stops people um, using good open practices um, and making it part of the good research practice. So we've already I've already mentioned it's not really currently part of the recruitment or promotions procedure within institutions, but that might change as the importance of um, research integrity grows and of open research itself grows. Um, and it will become more useful to be able to demonstrate participation in these open practices. Um, and it takes time. All of this takes time and can be seen as extra work. 
But we all suffer from file management or an organisational crisis um, with the work that we do. Um, and as research, researchers progress with their careers, the amount of data that they produce grows exponentially. Invest in time in, in a good, working with a good repository and properly signposting your data can have huge benefits um, for the researcher as well, for, as well as for any other potential users um, that may be using it. So and you also might need to acquire additional skills for this sort of thing. Um, technical writing, things like using GitHub, project management, using research software. Fortunately, we work in a university and there is lots of help available. But if you do find a gap, um, please let us know and we will do our very best to help you or to find somebody, somebody else that can help. Because um, we want to encourage people to use good open research practices as much as possible. And lastly, um, sharing might make you may mean that your research methodology or your data might be critiqued. Um, but really, this is a good thing. Um, peer reviewers or people accessing your data might find ways to analyse it and experiment with your work. And this is good science and how progress can happen. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about reproducibility. I've got some definitions here. Um, so what exactly is it that we're aiming for? So it's defined as the same analysis with the same data or code, but performed by a different person. And the key here is the same data or code. In order for that research to be reproduced, um, that key data needs to be made available. And it's not just about sharing the data. There needs to be openness and transparency in methods, code and materials too. And this kind of transparency allows trust in a piece of research, especially as it moves from development into production. Um, and I've just got a little slide here about um, a survey that was done a few years ago now, uh, where they first started to talk about the reproducibility crisis and it was generally agreed that there was a crisis as 70% of researchers had tried and failed to produce um, other scientific experiments and more than half had failed to reproduce their own experiments, but experiments which is even more worrying. Um, so now onto the more positive section. What can we do about all of this and what kind of practices can we um, get involved with that are going to help and um, stave off some of these poor practices? So the first that I'm going to speak about is um, pre-registration. How exactly does this work? So you can submit your study um, designed to a repository. Um, for example, the Open Science Framework, OSF, has a capability for this um, pre-registration facility. So you can pre-register your study with that on there. You get a time-stamped um, read-only plan at that stage. And in OSF, you can choose to embargo it at that time um, by setting it to private. So it doesn't necessarily have to be made publicly available at that point, but it's there, it's time-stamped. Um, and you can make that available a time of your own choosing, for example, um, when you make your research available as a verification of your original hypothesis. Some journals also accept pre-registered studies. Um, now that's something that we can check for you, whether a journal, a particular journal um, accepts pre-registrations, if it's something that you're um, considering doing. And in some journals, these pre-registrations can also be, also be submitted for peer review and if they're accepted um, at that point, then they become what's called registered reports. Um, and in a positive sense, this might mean that your work is more likely to go on to be publishable. Um, and the work also contains a record of its own intentions and origins. This all combines um, to create a more complete scientific record, um, not just your re research output, but all the processes involved in achieving that output. Prevents harking, which we men mentioned earlier, and also impact biases. Um, and committing your initial design to a repository also means that any work that re the results is also more likely to be reproducible as your methods will be transparent. Um, and open data. 
Um, so to ensure that research integrity, to ensure research integrity, and to improve the chances that your research is reproducible, it's really important to share research data if at all possible. Um, obviously, there will be cases where it's not possible to share data, um, something that might be ethically or commercially sensitive, for example. But even in those cases, it might still be possible to share methods. Um, so when we're talking about sharing data, it's not only the raw data that needs to be shared, but also your methodology, including any code um, that's needed to make sense of your methodology. methodology. And doing this allows reproducibility and allows others to use your data to con conduct further meta studies. So where to share? Um, so this is just a little um, slide which shows um, the kind of different options available. So um, you can add data as supplementary material um, to a research output. Um, but often in those cases, when you see them and you'll have seen them yourselves, um, the authors left no link to the data. Um, instead, they often say contact the author for you know further details or if you would like to see this data. Um, that creates a huge amount of work for the author themselves. If you have to contact them and they have to get stuff together to send to you, you have to wait, you might contact them, they might not get back to you because they might be too busy. So it's not an ideal solution. Um, and can be a bit frustrating and time consuming for everyone. Much easier if the data is available somewhere and is accessible and can be accessed with something as easy as a link. Um, our institutional repository, Pure, um, can be used to host data, but there are um, limits on size. Um, and so what most people do is they use a repository and then provide the metadata to us. Um, which can be easily done by adding a data set to Pure. There are lots of guides online or we can help you with that. Um, and then that, um, that data set will appear on your research researcher profile. I'm just going to do a shameless plug here as well. We've got um, some boot camps available at the moment for anyone that wants to learn a little bit more about their researcher profile, how to improve it, how to link it to ORCID and um, web of science and things like that. So please sign up and come along um, and we would be delighted to help you. So as I said, um, you can add your data sets to Pure um, and we encourage you to do that wherever they're hosted um, and they will show on your academic profile. Um, the other types of repositories that are becoming really popular and there's lots out there are the generic repositories like Figshare, OSF um, and Zenodo. Some institutions now have institutional versions of Figshare. We don't have anything like that yet, so we can just recommend and advise. Um, and at the moment, I'm seeing a lot of people using OSF and, and really um, being quite happy with that. So it's definitely a good one to investigate. Um, it works quite well as a, a project management tool um, and for collaborations as well as for hosting um, data as well. And it can link to things like GitHub and Dropbox and you can have all of that stuff that you've got in one kind of nice, neat little place. Um, some of the higher level disciplinary repositories that people um, in different disciplines are often advised or have to use. Um, it's a kind of that higher end of the kind of spectrum. Um, so for example, something like IRIS, which they use in geology um, to store um, seismic models. Um, and, and it's, fantastic obviously for that but can only be interrogated by something like python and by somebody with a really pretty good knowledge of that field um, so it's possible to get around that by storing there um, but making the metadata available somewhere else and in that case they use something called fdsn which is a network of digital seismographs and you can have your um metadata on there pointing towards where that data is but the benefit of that is um, FDSM will give you the DOI that you need to create a link um, to share on your papers, to share um, in Pure, um, and so that people can access it. Now, I still wouldn't really be able to fully understand that data, but at least um, with a link to the metadata, I know what it is, what kind of data is stored there, who it belongs to, what's contained um, within it, um, and that sort of thing. 
Um, and here is just a little slide about FAIR. Um, so that's the acronym that's often used when talking about sharing data um, to make it findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, so FAIR encourages the use of those persistent identifiers that I was just talking about, um, like DOIs, really, really important if you can to give your um, your data at DOI so that it's easily findable and shareable um, and accessible for other people. Um, if you've not got a repository to do that, we can do that for you at the add in to pure stage. Um, accessibility can be greatly improved by providing all codes and materials, as I've said, um, and providing a, a readme file um, explaining your methodology. Um, as I've said, OSF allows you to connect to GitHub and Dropbox and to add any external files that you've created. It also has a really neat um, file structure for organising the different elements of your research and making everything findable within that. Um, FAIR also encourages um, keywords that are accessible beyond, using keywords that are accessible beyond your discipline. And in the days when we're trying to encourage interdisciplinary interdisciplinary research as much as possible, it's really good to think about not just what makes sense to me in my discipline, but what makes make sense with outside of that. Um, it also encourages the use of open file formats like .pngs rather than proprietary formats like .docx and .ppts. It encourages um, the use of CC licenses so that other people looking at your research know exactly what they can do with it and how they can reuse it. And we've got lots of information on that on our website. Um, if anything doesn't make sense, please get in touch with us and we can help you with it. And um, the last um, bit of the open research jigsaw is open access and open access publishing. Um, this gives your researchers a great op greater opportunity to build on your work. Um, and as I said, the final piece of the open research jigsaw. My colleague um, Joanna does a much more in-depth um, session on open access, which you can find recordings on, um, explaining the different routes that I've mentioned here in a little bit more detail. Um, so there's the gold route for um, publishing open access with APC fees and um, the green route for the author accepted manuscript to be made um, pub made available um, and then diamond open access um, usually funded by other sources um, and free to to publish. One more thing to watch out for um, when it comes to the publishing stage in terms of research integrity is predatory publishers. Um, Predatory publishers are on the increase and they charge a fee for publishing in the same way as legitimate publishers, um, but they often fail to provide the same level of service. So they might miss out on things like peer review or editing um, and offer to have your article published much more quickly than it would normally you know, take in the normal process. So you can check um, if a publisher is a member of, of the appropriate organisations like DOAJ and OASPA, um, or we can check this for you. You can also check what kinds of indexes they appear in, what kinds of peer review processes they um, offer, and these should be transparent. There's a really good tool or online um, tool called Think, Check, Submit. Um, it's a really good website for checking this out. And again, we're here to help with this. So I just want to mention a couple of resources um, that are useful. One is the Turing Way, um, it's really worth checking out their website. They've got absolutely tons of stuff on there. Um, it's open source, collaboratively kind of put together, where there's lots of advice about um, making research more reproducible, advice about version control, licensing code, um, and with case studies on there as well. There's project design things like um, road mapping your project, file naming conventions, style guides. Um, um, yes, just loads of information. It's kind of a dip in, dip out um, sort of website. There's just too much to take in at once, but um, it's definitely worth checking out. You might find some useful stuff on there. Um, and the other um, thing that I was going to mention was the organisation called Re Reproducibility. Um, it's a journal club initiative 
um, to help early ca career researchers build a community um, uh, that, uh, for those that are interested in open and reproducible research. Um, there are quite a few across the country. Edinburgh have a really active one, I think. I don't think we have one, a, a dedicated one here in Aberdeen. So if anybody's interested in starting one, that might be something worth doing. But it's worth going on there and having a look at what the others are doing. Um, so, um, and I've got a, just got a slide in here as well um, about our institutional repository, Pure. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I will stop the recording and if anyone's got any questions.